celebrating the storytellers who widen our horizons. Authors on the Air I'm very, very careful at who I'll let into the tent to have creative input. Um, but once they are, I listen to every single thing they say. Evan is me is a badass, which isn't a thing, but you know, that's kind of how I have to look at it. But then I'm like, oh, now I get to go in and, and, and say these snide remarks that I would say, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna talk about the weather. You must be pathologically dull. Two artists at the top of their game. Greg Hurwitz is an international best-selling author with 23 thrillers, numerous screenplays, television scripts, and graphic novels, including 25 Batman editions for DC and over 40 graphic novels for Marvel. His most recent is Dark Horse, the latest in the Orphan X series, where Evan is drawn again into the untenable, helping a complicated bad guy when his 18-year-old daughter is kidnapped by a cartel of even worse bad guys. We all dream of having our characters brought to life by a legendary narrator, and Greg works with the best of the best. Since 2008, his work has been rendered by Scott Brick, winner of over 60 Earphones Awards, five Audis, five Sova Awards for voiceover, and a Grammy nomination for the multicast recording of 2011's The Mark of Zorro. To have two of the most prolific and energetic artists in the same room at the same time is an experience I think you will totally enjoy. But yes, yeah, so Scott's done all my books since The Crime Writer. And then when my new audiobooks come up um, for renewal, I've had Scott record them. And I've also put Scott in my contracts, like when I've moved or re-up with audio. I say the voice of Orphan X has to be Scott Brick. And the fact that you can get on his schedule is a miracle in itself. Are you kidding? I would I would clear my schedule to make sure I'm available for because seriously after after this most recent move, the publisher came up to me at an audiobook event uh, at the Audio Awards, and she said, "I have promised my firstborn child to make sure that we can get both Greg and you know." Uh, Greg at the stu at the uh, at the publisher and you in the studio. Please don't make me a liar. So, uh. <laughs> without giving too much away, what can you tell us about Dark Horse? Well, it's a very different sort of mission for Orphan X in that the person who calls him, you know, so he has a a one eight hundred number. It's a one eight five five to nowhere, and if you call it, you might actually hear Mister Scott Brick on the other end pick up that phone number. Um, and by the way, we, we did that in the, when I had the manuscript of Orphan X, I hadn't even sold it yet. I called Scott and said, hey, I'm doing something new. Can I come over? Can we record something here? Um, and so that's been, that, that predates the publication or the sale of Orphan X. And so when that phone rings, Evan Smoke answers, and he has to do anything to help the person in question. And this time, the person on the other end of the phone is somebody who is as complex and dark as he is. He's a sort of kind of a cartel, but he's more skirting the edges of international law and legality. He's in South Texas and his daughter has been kidnapped by a vicious cartel member who is more, um, I don't know, genuinely authentically seated in cartel violence and torture uh, as a competitor move. He thinks of himself as an unconventional businessman, but he's also caused a lot of damage. And so the question is, it's the first time Evan has gotten a call from somebody who is not an unwitting victim. He's as compl complicated as Evan is himself. And the question becomes, can you save, uh, can you help a bad man for a just cause? And in a lot of ways, that's a mirror for Evan's own upbringing and the questions that he lives with late at night himself. Uh, and so he goes into this very confused as to whether he should take this mission or kill the guy who called him. You've taken a risk in Dark Horse because the Evan in this story is a little different than the Evan we used to know. That's right. He's, it's, very, it's very important to me that he continues to evolve in ways that are real and concrete. It's, it's a living, growing series. And part of that is, look, Evan was raised on the 10 Assassin's Commandments handed down to him by Jack Johns, his handler for the DOD and his father figure. 
And Orphan X finds him basically breaking all 10 of those commandments. And so when we meet him, he's in a process of change and growth. And I think that's something that's a little bit different. I don't establish him at some kind of baseline and build from there. I, we meet him not as Orphan X when he's operating, you know, illicitly from the government. You know, he's taken out of a foster home at the age of 12 and trained to be an assassin. And, and then he was at the age of 18. He starts to commit these, you know, international executions in violation of international law. Um, we don't meet him there. We don't meet him when he first leaves the program and goes on the run. And we don't even meet him when he first starts to become the nowhere man, who is the person who answers that encrypted anonymous line to help people. We meet him when he's in the process of getting his first nowhere man case that brings the past screaming into the present um, and sees the dissolution of his whole worldview. And that's a process I started in Orphan X and I've continued it through the series of him trying to reconstitute and rebuild himself into something greater and more complex than than as he's defined in the perfection of those Ten Commandments. He's emerging from the shell of his former self into a new understanding of what it means to be human. And that's really what the series is about. Scott Brick, when the story comes to you, you take it to a whole different level. What kind of preparation do you do before you go into the studio? I, I, I'm not a fan, as I, I'm a huge book fan, but I'm not a fan of reading ahead. I, don't want, I, I never look to the end of the novel to see you know, what happens. But sometimes in my work life, I have to, because, you know, so many times people think protagonist as the main character, the good guy, right? But really the meaning of protagonist is the character who changes. So, um, I mean, hell, you could look at Star Trek, you could argue that Spock was the, was the protagonist because he's the one who undergoes change throughout the series. Um, yeah, we're nitpicking but nevertheless what i do is i i go into the booth before i go into the booth i look and see what kind of man is evan at the beginning of the book and what kind of man is he at the end because let's say uh, a, a completely different book uh, if, if this was a book about tolerance racism you know uh learning to live with the, you know seeing the good in other people if you if you have a character the protagonist if he was you know a borderline racist let's say at the beginning um, uh, and yet at the end he stands up for somebody whose rights are being violated well what I need to do is throughout the book is is kind of look at that as like this as this arc right you know okay every single time that racism comes up I will therefore raise the stakes here and here and here and here and here and here so that when we get to the end and he stands up for that guy it's not a surprise um, that's kind of my approach to to the work and then there's other minutia like is it third person is it first person you know how is my approach going to change in in orphan x it's third person but it's so like deeply third person that i read i read it like it's first person um because it's just so rich layered textured um those are the things i tend to look at first and foremost Greg, you've grown such a dedicated fan base for Orphan X. What do you think it is that attracts and retains that audience? Uh, on the one hand, incredibly lethal and disciplined. And on the other hand, there's a vulnerability in terms of his interactions with the real world. I, I often say he doesn't speak the strange language of intimacy. He never learned that. And so he's trying to map his way into, in some ways, the ordinary. One of the things that defines or when he interfaces with it. And first he wants no part of it, but increasingly, because, you know, intimacy brings mess, right? It brings confusion. It brings, people are complicated. People are messy. We all are. And he can be, he can exist in perfection when he's outside of that. But his process of becoming and his process of trying to evolve and shed a former, like break through a former shell of himself into a new understanding of himself is something I think a lot of people can relate to. I think these, we tend to operate with it, with constrictions around us, a lot of armor. And armor is amazing because it protects us, but it also limits flexibility, right? And so in some ways, it's the process of him shedding that armor to become a more flexible human, a more flexible operator, a more flexible assassin, a more flexible, um, you know, tenant, co-tenant in the Castle Heights residential tower where he's constantly beset by quotidian concerns. Um, yeah, and I think that he, I think he, I think people really relate to that. And he's, 
he's frank and honest with himself about his flaws and limitations and the places where you know he's immensely courage courageous in certain ways but he shies away from anything that involves courage when it comes to intimacy and he's honest with himself about that and with the reader and i think everyone can relate to the process of trying to become more human you know or or to to kind of thaw our way into different kinds of relationships and a different understanding of the world and that's really what he's trying to do scott in my own practice as a narrator one of the hardest things for me is switching characters how do you do that so well i get asked a lot about switching characters and you know my i i I, i've been told i have a facility as for switching from one to the other and all i could think about all i can think of as a reason for to whatever extent i i do it well is because i'm so eager to read every single character in the book i mean these these elevator conversations that go on between evan and the other tenants um you know <laughs> whether it's you know peter evan smoke you know or or or, or ida you know um she is in many ways every every time that she is on the page it's the highlight of the book for me or god tommy stojak i just i am so eager i get i kind of always put myself in the in the in the in the frame of mind that okay whatever book i'm narrating whatever main character it is whatever protagonist it is that's me i just have to kind of use myself as the default okay Evan is me as a badass which isn't a thing but you know that's kind of how i have to look at it but then i'm like oh now I get to go in and, and, and see these snide remarks that I would say, you know, you're going you're gonna to talk about the weather. You must be pathologically dull. You know, I just, I just, I'm so eager that I don't know, maybe that, maybe that makes the, the, the switch happen faster, that, uh, that I could switch from one to the other, going into Tommy Stojak. I have begged, and Greg will, will attest to this, I have begged him repeatedly, please do an entire book from Tommy Stojak's point of view, and yet he keeps refusing and refusing and refusing. And, you know, I do my best to carry on. Scott wants me, I think Scott wants Tommy to kill off Evan and just take over his orphan axe. You know, it's funny, I think when I think of the audio books, I think of, and that collaboration between me and Scott, I think of myself as the composer, and Scott is the conductor, and then also all the sections. Speaking of a symphony, there are many members of your orchestra. Who are some of those people? You know, I have a wonderful agent. I have the best agent in the world, uh, Lisa Erbach Vance. She's with Aaron Priest, and she's spectacular. She's always my first reader. I mean, I have expert, I have subject matter expert readers, right? I have gun experts. I have, you know, world-class hackers. I have, you know, emergency room physicians. I do all that stuff. But, I mean, when it comes to the final creative um sort of the overall view, the, 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 the overall story itself. It's Lisa, and then I've chosen extremely carefully my editors in the, in the US, I'm with Keith Kayla at Minotaur Books. And when I switched to Minotaur Books, actually after the crime writer, it was specifically to be with him as an editor. It wasn't sort of, you know, where can I get a deal? You know, who's bidding, who's the publisher? I wanted to go with Keith Kayla based on how he engages in that way. Um, and, I, and I'm very close with my editor in, um, in the UK. His name's Roland White. And so I have a very, like, a kind of core group. I have a wonderful UK agent as well. And when people say something, and the thing is that I've discovered that's really important, I learned a lot of this in Hollywood, it's not always that the note itself is correct. But if you trust that people are, have a certain level of facility and skill and talent in interacting with narrative, a lot of times if they have a hesitation, I feel like my job is to um, excavate the editorial anxiety that's be- beneath the note. And that was very important. I learned, I, th- I think I learned that. I learned that in, in certainly in early manuscripts. I worked with, uh, with a couple of terrific editors um, early on. Um, but you learn that a lot in Hollywood where you'll get a note on a script that says, this is really slow. I'm really bored at the opening of the third act. And it's easy to say, well, you're a suit, who cares, don't pay attention, I'm an artiste. But a lot of times if I look at it I'll, and I really take a, have a good faith engagement with their problem there, what I'll discover is that's not where it's slow, that's where you noticed it and wrote it down. The problem is there's a big lull in the second act that started putting you on your heels and by the time it reached the top of the third act, you know, you noted it and, and wrote it down. And so 
it's very important to not immediately engage with just the content of the note. Um, but I, you know, look, I also, I'm very fortunate. I've always had a, a, a great deal of autonomy in terms of what stories I want to write, what directions I want to take. I mean, you know, it's no one really knows what I'm doing till I deliver the manuscript. Um, you know, I say I'll do, you know, the deals are for like three more Orphan X books, right? And so I have a lot of latitude, but with this team, I've worked with them so closely. And like with Scott, I've been working with since 2008. I mean, that's like, that's like longer than four Hollywood marriages, right? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of history that gets built up in these things. And so I kind of, I have a sense of where everybody is. And so, you know, and some, some books are, are a lot smoother. I mean, Dark Horse was probably the smoothest editorial process I've ever had. I mean, there's just very little notes on it at all. But other ones, there's more impact. I'm, I'm always trying to stretch. I'm always trying to, I always want, want to reach a point writing a manuscript that I'm slightly scared that I won't pull it off. You know, I want everything to be a challenge. I don't want to write the same book over and over and I want to do stuff that I don't think I can fully do. And so sometimes I get out over my skis and I'll get like a bigger note that says, I'm, you know, these things are stretching out uh, in certain directions, aspects need to be thinned out and I have to really pay attention to that. So Scott, give me more backstory on when Greg came and asked you to record the message for the 800 number. He calls me one day out of the blue and says, uh, your studio in your house? I'm like, yeah, it's my basement. And he goes, can I come over? Sure. And we record the, the, the recording for if you call 855 to nowhere. Um, and uh, I had never seen this book before. And he comes over and I'm sitting in the booth and he goes, okay, this is what the series is about. This is what the character is about. This is what he does. This is where it's, you know, a, a little bit about kind of where it's going to go. I just thought, okay. I said, you know, have you sold this? No. But in the book, you've listed this this toll free number, and he goes, yes. And I said, when did you buy that? When did you register that? He said, it's like one of the first things I did. And I thought, this is the kind of. <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that I just dearly love Greg as as a friend of mine. If, if I was like, you know, approached by an author who told me that he did something like that, that he got it, that he understood, there's so much more that can be done than the print version, than the e-version, you know. I just thought this this is the dream relationship. When when um, I've, I've had conversations with authors that just did not go well, and I'm like, okay, this, this works you know, in print, it really won't work on audio. Oh, that's okay. Just go ahead and read it the way it is on print. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Greg is the antithesis of that. He is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, audio is different, you know. In the old days, there was the author's words and the reader's brain. And the only thing in between was their eyes, right, translating it, you know, and, and you know, then their imagination. Now there's an extra step. Uh, whether people might be visually challenged, maybe they, they're, they're <laughs> time challenged, maybe they just they only have time on their commute. They're listening now. Well, now I'm an extra step along the way. There's the author's words, there's me, and there's the listener's brain. My job is to be, I, I call it the construct. I am the construct. I want to be appropriate to the book, but not so much that they're not paying attention to the author's words. I don't want to take, I don't want to, I don't want to steal focus. I want it to be appropriate, but not too much. In, in many ways, although, look, I'm an actor, I'm as shallow as any other actor out there, believe me. Um, uh, it's wonderful when you get a great review, but when I do, sometimes I worry that I wasn't doing my job. I want it to be just enough to stimulate, to stimulate the listener's imagination and let them take it from there. It comes down in, in, in a lot of ways, I think. Look, people have been listening to stories a lot longer than they've been reading them, you know? And one of the things I learned, like I was talking about the editorial process, if you pick people who you trust and then you have to trust them, those are the rules. Because I found, you know, in development with TV, with film, it's just like any relationship. It's either getting better or getting worse. Nothing stays the same, you know? And so you either have something where you have trusted partners and everybody engages in a way that raises the game and you get a positive feedback loop, 
or everyone's territorial and miserable. And I have felt before as the writer, like I'm, you know, out drunk behind the bar at two in the morning with a broken bottle, like fighting people off to protect the script. And if I'm ever doing that, I'm not, I haven't done my job well. You know, it's just, everything's the wrong way. Everything's going the wrong way. And so part of what I learned, I've had the benefit of working with some fantastic actors, directors. Um, and it's one of the things that I've really learned is that, you know, you want, you want people to take and have ownership in something, right? Like you can fit what I would know about being an audio narrator, you know, in a thimble, you know? So it's like, if I choose Scott, you know, I, I listened to the crime writer and it was done. I was like, he's doing all my books from here on out. And so if you have that, you know, there's an engagement, which doesn't mean that you don't have a feedback loop. Hey, let's do this. Let's angle this way. Scott will call me. I'm going to do this. You wrote it this way. Can I do it this way? Of course you want engagement. Of course you're going to have healthy, creative disagreements from time to time. Though Scott and I have had, I think, virtually none. But what, what you have to have is to give somebody, like you're passing off the baton, right? I can keep running around the track after Scott all I want, but like he's who I've trusted with that to run the anchor leg on it. And so the more that he feels ownership in that, I mean, it's funny because I'm the opposite. I never mind when the reviews are glowing about Scott because it's like he does a hell of a job. You know, he's playing a full orchestra, right? All the parts and conducting. And, you know, the better he does and the more credit he gets for that and the more recognition, like, that's great. I'm happy to be upstream from that or downstream from that. You know, it's, it's the best that anyone can do is what I want. You know, and so you try to create those circumstances creatively where, where everyone's empowered to do that. You guys have both already achieved so much. Greg, what's still on your bucket list? Yeah, there's a lot I still want to do. Um, you know, it's funny because it shifted from kind of concrete things more to experiences, if that makes sense. And so it's not so much that I have more places I want to travel. It's that I want to travel with with people who understand them in a different way. You know, so it's like it's, it's shifted a little bit to being concrete things. Um, I think it would be, you know, I have a play that I'm trying to get on its feet right now that would be something new and and quite riveting um i published a poem for the first time last year uh which was really fun so it's always it's always interesting to me to kind of stretch in new directions and in new ways but a lot of it is you know we tend to be reaching for new things and a lot of it is is can i bring a better game and a better and more whole part of myself to the series that I'm already doing. You know, that in some ways is the biggest challenge for me. Isn't necessarily to go do something that, you know, like a interpretive, interpretive dance, you know, at a, at a, um, at a coffee house. It's not necessarily that it's the new, but it's, it's always trying to stretch. And, and, and for me, there's so much of my thinking is around this series and what are, what are new um, stones I can kick over and find, little, you know, polished jewels beneath them. Um, so that's where a lot of my head is right now. In the last uh, few years, um, my mother started um, uh, kind of divesting herself of, uh, she started giving me things and she says, I've accumul accumulated these things over the years and I don't think I need things anymore. I need, I need experiences. And, uh, you know, in the last few years, hell, I, I've, I think I've, uh, before COVID, I, I visited like four, I was on four continents. I went hang gliding for the first time, it, uh, you know, being you know, completely afraid of heights. Um, yeah, uh, that's what I want in life, but it's also what I want in my work. Uh, challenges that, that matter, you know. People come to me and they're like, publishers will approach me and say, well, I don't know if I, if, if I could afford to have you do this book, but really interested in having you do it. And I say, I do that in a heartbeat because it matters to me. You know, um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, to me, that's, that's the coin of the realm. When we all began our adventure, we were attracted to experiences that brought us joy. In time, many of us learned that the ultimate expression of happiness is to bring that joy to others. For Greg Hurwitz and Scott Brick, being at the pinnacle of success reveals another level of opportunity. In a sense, even as we continue our life story, we are circling back 
to where it all began. Find out more about Scott Brick at scottbrick.net. For the full scoop on Dark Horse and a deeper dive into the adventures of Greg Hurwitz, visit greghurwitz.net. I'm Terry Shepard for Authors on the Air, and I'll see you in the next chapter.